twenty is a time that most of us wouldn't forget, and it would remind us of the same thing: the pandemic. Let me tell you how the pandemic really started for me. Let me describe my family to you. I am a woman with chronic illness, an autoimmune disorder, and over eighty percent disability. I live with my parents, and both of them are in the age group of above sixty, which means they are more vulnerable. my illness also makes me more vulnerable towards the virus when the lockdown was suddenly announced when we did not get enough time to prepare ourselves that is when i realized how extremely difficult and nearly impossible it is for us to just live like one family unit without help from the larger society i was worried where do i get Our food from. I can't step out. My parents can't step out because, uh, well, the virus. That is when I found a very small clipping going around uh, the Facebook and also WhatsApp. It was of a young boy, college going, maybe twenty years old, and he just said in very simple terms, if. anyone who is in the vulnerable group and is alone at home he would love to bring any vegetables or any food items any essentials to us i called him he just asked me for the list that we need and he was right there the next day morning that was the first and the last time we needed his help kolkata was one of the last cities where the big baskets and all the online shopping was uh, opened but slowly we learned how to deal with the pandemic the vegetable cart started coming across all the roads however though it was the only one time that we needed his help he did something very very important for us to survive this pandemic he gave us hope he let us know that we are not alone he let us know that we could survive because we are together in it and that made me really wonder who was he what role was he playing he was not the government he was not a part of the corporate where where does he settle in in our scheme of things he was what we would call the para chele the neighborhood boy though he did not belong to my neighbor he lived around 4 to 5 kilometers away from where i was and it reminded me of my old neighborhood so where i stay right now we shifted just a few years ago and in the previous neighborhood that is when my father had grown up and he spent nearly 60 years of his life there at that place all we needed to do was eat, just have a cry for help sometimes without even meaning to call for other people but just having a cry out of despair and from nowhere we would have all this neighborhood boys and girls uncles and aunts everybody come together all our friends maybe these are people we would not talk to throughout the day sometimes throughout the year sometimes but if there was a need people would come together and this was becoming more and more rare even in my old neighborhood this phenomena was extremely common across all cities even the bigger metros of this country at say 30 years back and then slowly as we started changing the way we live as we started having more gated communities this started changing what gated communities do is that they not only create a gate between the people living inside and outside it also somehow creates a very blank wall between the people who are living inside if we look closer they are so homogenous that it really doesn't help them survive 
and answer a call for help as much as it would help if you're living in a larger heterogeneous space. So then what is the civil society? What is the community? What is the society? Well, if you look at the theories, you would realize that the civil society is often known as the third sector. The first and the second being the government and businesses. And yet it is a third sector. I really don't know how they call it the third sector because it gives a sense of ranking it somehow. So the civil society, so the space which is called the third sector has always been completely fluid. It's not as well-defined as the government. It's not as well-defined as businesses. The civil society today very often means the NGOs. It means the community-based organizations. It means the trusts and the societies that are incorporated. But what happens in a time like this, when I needed this boy, when I needed this neighborhood to come to me, and I couldn't reach out to any NGO, I couldn't reach out to any society, then was he a part of the civil society? Well, around a few years back, say maybe 25 to 30 years back, civil society was largely synonymous with voluntary work. And what he was doing was really that. The first NGO uh, in the world was uh, formed around the late 1880s. And that was the same time when even India had its first, let's say, a society incorporated under the act in the late 1890s. And religion was a very important factor at that time. So most of the work was driven by certain religious groups. In fact, religion, the churches, the temples, the satsang uh, groups, they, are, or has, they have always been this core group that people go out to, to meet others, to engage with others and to really solve their problems. Well, to the point when one of my friends stopped going to the church because it really became a weekly matchmaking event site for her. But that's what religious uh, sites became for most people, where they were socializing and they were solving other people's problems. Uh, the grip of the religious institutions were slowly redefining itself. And then we started finding other spaces where we were trying to find who we are and who do we connect with. Slowly, we actually stopped also being a part of our neighborhood communities. For whatever reasons, long work hours, uh, changing mindsets, time, everything, everything really stopped us. So at that point, it begs to, for us to understand what is the civil society. Once I was in a group of, in a masterclass of people from uh, around 50 different countries. And interestingly, when we were discussing this, somebody asked, well, if this is a civil society, no wonder the government is quite uncivil. This was a person from the US. And interestingly, there was another person from Nigeria who said, and so are the businesses. Are we then trying to say that there's only a certain group which is a civil society? And then the businesses and the government don't hold the responsibility. Well, probably that's not what we were trying to say in the theories, but a lot of the times, the messages that the words give are very important. And slowly we started moving to, in the pandemic, trying to find our way through. I think we also realized the true meaning of civil society because the government and the businesses came together along with the people, people who don't know each other, people who are not just NGOs, people who are not incorporated anywhere, people who are volunteers, people who have been faceless most of their lives, to put the society together and help them survive and help them thrive.
since I have a very high disability and I couldn't go out, I started looking for ways that I can start helping other people sitting at my home. It almost looked impossible because everybody was at home. What help can they possibly need from somebody sitting at home? And the answer came to me very quickly through a WhatsApp message. They needed people to start calling up migrants across the country to see if they can help them in any way, be it the food. And over time, when the trains or the buses across state lines opened up, if they can find them spots on those trains and buses. Many of these voluntary groups were actually organized by the state governments of Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand themselves. That they are the ones I was working with, and maybe they were more across the country. Suddenly, we were working for people and with people we really don't know. Because we just realized that there was one thread that helps us connect together, which is that we need to go beyond this sudden pandemic. We need to be strong and we need to survive this and if possible thrive through it. We started hearing words uh, about uh, that we have always known but never paid attention to, like the migrants. If we think that this is the first time that the migrants have been walking back home, let's just think again, it is not. But this is the first time that they have been walking back home the thousands of kilometers where they did not have a tea stall on the roadside that they could actually rest at. Where they could not hijack even for one hour on any of the trucks or the buses. This was the first time when all through the road, if they needed some money, they couldn't quickly get some work for two or three days. And yet, this is also the first time when the whole country started talking about them and trying to understand why are they walking back home? Because we were awakened to a reality that has always been there. And similarly, all the vulnerable groups have always been there. Senior citizens like my parents have always been there. People with disabilities like me have always been there. But suddenly we started talking about it. While this pandemic has done a lot of, well, disruptions, it has also been a magnifying glass to look at these inequalities. When we were all locked up in the room, we started opening our windows and talking to our neighbors and just saying that my parents too, who was 70 years old, is not able to do this. And somebody else said, yes, I understand because you know what, my wife who is sick right now is not able to do this. And that conversation started brewing across windows, across balconies, across Facebook groups. And that is when we started talking about vulnerable groups in a way that we have never done. A voice that was always unheard started being heard of. And that was the charm of it all. That was the importance and the significance of it all. So suddenly people who otherwise had found a way to adjust were not able to adjust. And hence, we needed the neighborhood voice to come. We needed other people on a global network, sometimes a local network and sometimes a national network to help migrants and may help other vulnerable groups. This was the magic of it. So when we sit back together and we try to understand what is the civil society, I think we need to actually start claiming it ourselves. We have to understand that the civil society is nothing or nobody but us, all of us. We as business people, we as mothers, we as daughters, we as fathers, we as the government, we as people who are in the actual NGO space. The NGO space today is the eighth largest industry in the world. And yet in a pandemic like this, we need the person who is our neighbor just beside us more than anything else. That is the magic of being together, of staying together. And that cannot happen if we are always in our gated communities. Because guess what? Our comfort zones, which is the gated communities, probably can help us stay comfortable. 
but comfort doesn't help us grow and comfort doesn't help us survive. We are looking for complementary things to come together, complementary skills to come together. That can only happen in a heterogeneous space. And that is why today it is a good time to step back and just say that let us redefine the civil society and become the civil society. It is the time for us to actually step back and just say, let the world not bounce back because back was a lot of difficulty. There was a lot of unspoken troubles that we were going through. And for once we started talking about them. So let us bounce forward. And let us understand that it's only when we are together that we can come out stronger. And we, the us, is not just any one kind of people, but everyone, everyone together. Let us become the civil society. Thank you.